for uh, more than 15 years at this point. And the way I came to even begin to consider writing about anger is kind of a strange story because, of course, <laughs> anger has always undergirded the work that I do. I wouldn't write about gender inequality and racial inequality and economic inequality if I weren't angry about the ways in which power is unevenly distributed in the world. Um, and But I knew as a young journalist, in the, just because of like the broth that we're all marinated in, <laughs> that if I permitted my anger to be the leading note of my work as a writer, that it would in fact undermine my work. It would, we're all, you know, women, marginalized people, we all understand that the, the ways in which our, the expression of our anger is discouraged, the, the horrible trick of it is that it's used to take us less, you know, it's an excuse to take us less seriously. Um, and so as a journalist, writing about these issues that made me live it, and I didn't, it's not like I sat and I thought about it. Um, because anger, of course, can also go hand in hand quite naturally with the expression, expression of humor and um, you know positivity and good cheer. But I, I really made sure that my writing was not angry on its face for a really long time because I knew strategically it was a bad idea to lead with anger as a writer. Um, and then in the wake of the 2016 election, um, I experienced this kind of professional... I mean, I think also psychological and emotional <laughs> paralysis. <laughs> um, and I had covered Hillary Clinton's campaign extensively as a journalist, and I was in this weird position of um, simultaneously not being shocked that Hillary Clinton had lost and being shocked to the point of paralysis that Donald Trump had won. Both things were true at the same time. And I was trying to wrestle with what is my responsibility um, as a journalist who, who's trying to tell this story moving forward. Um, you know, as a, as a feminist journalist, as a white feminist, what are, what's my work moving forward? And I was wrestling with it, and I couldn't figure out what my, what my job was. And I was talking to my husband in the last week of 2016, just, you know, we were on vacation between Christmas and New Year's. We were out for a walk. And I said to him, I'm trying to figure out what I'm supposed to do, but I can't think clearly because I'm so angry. And I understood that my anger was clouding my thinking. I couldn't come... I couldn't come to a clear conclusion about what my next step should be or how I should approach this, my work or this story because anger was a kind of force that was obscuring my, my, re, my re, reason. And my husband, who is not a journalist, he's a public defender, he said, he said very casually, I think as much to have something to say back to me as anything else, he said, well, maybe you should write about your anger. And this suggestion was so bananas. <laughs> But it was the merest suggestion that I could do that. Immediately after he said it, everything got recast in my brain. It was like, well, I'm not exaggerating when I say that in this last, the last week of December 2016, I went home from that walk and I sat down with a piece of paper and I wrote a list of all the things that would basically become the outline of what this book is. And that was before the Women's March, before a record number of women ran for office, before um, the hashtag Me Too eruption, before the sort of um, re-engagement of a labor movement in the United States led in many ways by women as part of the teacher, strikers, teacher strikes and the fast food worker strikes, it was before the testimony of Christine Blasey Ford, before the testimony of Jody Wilson, Ray Bolt, Ray and was it? <laughs> um, it, you know, because what that suggestion had permitted me to do was look at all the things I write about, present, future, and historically, and consider anger not as, a, not as an idea or an emotion or, or a reaction that gets in the way of clear thinking, but as a clarifying frame through which to better understand the history of social and political movements, of activism, of, of so many of the fights about representation and power. Um, that animate our political discourse and have, you know, for hundreds of years. And, um, and I, I do think I will, that's this one idea that I would sort of like to leave you with, which is that so much of what I think we have been prevented from doing is taking anger seriously, our own anger certainly, but also the anger that has shaped the world in which we live. We have been discouraged from looking it head on. 
and asking questions about how the anger of marginalized people, how the anger of women has been a shaping force in our countries, their economies, their social structures, their sexual politics. Um, and I want to just suggest to you that once you start sort of looking straight at it, everything looks different. And the, the headlines you read in the news look different. The photographs you see on, on television, the internet, they look different. You start to see patterns that you didn't see before. Um, you start to see...